So my name is Valerie Pop, and I'm the Senior Program Officer here at the American Council of Learned Societies. And I wanted to welcome all of you to what is the first of what we hope will be two webinars for our Getty ACLS postdoctoral fellowships in the history of art. So I thank you for, for joining us today. It is uh, 9 a.m. here in, in New York City, which is where ACLS is based. But I know that you're coming in from all over the world, and I appreciate your taking the time to, to be with us today. And I'm happy to walk you through different elements of this program in our history, answer your questions, and talk a little bit about what makes for a competitive fellowship application in this program. Um, as I said earlier, for those of you who are just joining us, I will be taking questions during the last part of the session. It'll be a Q&A. And so if you have questions during the course of the, the presentation, feel free to pop them in the chat. You can also wait until the very end when I say that the session will be designated Q&A, and then you can put them in the, the question um, in the chat box there. If you need anything over the course of the presentation, you're all able to raise your hands as attendees. This is done in a webinar style format, so that means that you really can't see one another on screen. You should see me, my face, um, and the name of my co-host, Senior Director of US Programs, John Paul Christie at, at ACLS, who's not on camera this morning, um, but he's, he's very much with us. But you shouldn't be able to see one another. You can chat one another, however, so that's the difference between this and a typical Zoom meeting for those of you who aren't as familiar with the webinar format. All right, to get us going, I am going to show you a handy dandy little presentation about this fellowship program, about ACLS, and it'll walk you through the, the different dimensions of this program's history, where it's gone, where it's been, where we hope it's going to go, and then how you can create a competitive fellowship application. Today's agenda, which I gave you a little bit of an overview in the, um, in the invitation to this webinar, but I'll have it up here again. It's just an introduction to ACLS. I'll give you an overview of the program history. We're gonna go through all of the different application components together, one by one. A lot of this information is already available on ACLS's website, www.acls.org. Um, in the competitions and deadlines page. And if you look and you'll see Getty ACLS postdoctoral fellowships in the history of art. So you can follow along if you want to on that page as I'm going through all of the components, but obviously I'm going to be adding information that isn't readily accessible on our website, accessible or available on our website um, to supplement what's there. Um, I'm gonna then go through tips for creating an effective application. And then we'll have the Q and A that I talked about earlier. And please again, type your questions in the chat. So for those of you who aren't familiar with ACLS, and I don't like to assume that everyone is familiar with ACLS, we are a private nonprofit and we were founded in 1919. So that means that we're just over a century old, just over a hundred years old. And what we are is basically a federation or a big group of 75 different scholarly societies in all of the major disciplines in the humanities and social sciences. So that's everything from literature to history to anthropology to very relevant for this program, art history and architectural history. There are also very, a lot of subdisciplines and interdisciplinary fields that are encompassed within ACLS. So that means that if you work on say Renaissance studies, um, you, you may be part of the, the professional organization that brings together all of the scholars in Renaissance studies all over the world. So that's just a little bit about who we are and how we function. Um, our mission, and it's been our mission for quite some time, is the advancement of humanistic studies in all fields of the humanities and social sciences, and the maintenance and strengthening of national societies dedicated to those studies. Right? Um, so the second part of that is what I was just talking about, all of these different learned societies that represent the scholars who are in these different fields. The first part of that statement, the advancement of humanistic studies in all fields, we do that in a couple of different ways. One of the ways is through advocacy, um, bringing together groups who have a shared interest and shared commitment to the humanities, talking about issues that are of great import, whether that's in the United States or globally to the humanistic and social science communities, um, writing white papers, doing research, um, writing op-eds. Our, our president, Joy Connolly, has, has been a very energetic and, and vocal presence since she joined us last year. So those are some of the ways in which we carry out the part of that mission through advocacy. The other piece of the, the way that we do our work, and that's why all of you are here today, is through administering fellowship and grant programs that support scholars all over the world. Um, this has been a core part of ACLS's business for, for decades and decades. 
So we're, we're quite familiar with it, although the exact number and nature of the programs has really evolved over time. And I'll talk a little bit about that right now. So our fellowships change every year. It's wise to keep an eye on ACLS's website, follow us on social media, follow us on Twitter, follow us on Facebook, to stay aware of exactly what the fellowship competitions are in any given year. Um, they change. Sometimes programs that have been around for quite some time are what we call sunset. They, they go away. We add new programs all the time. This year has been a very busy year for ACLS in terms of adding new programs. So it's always a good idea to keep an eye on our fellowship list and to see what competitions are going to be available for upcoming cycles. We typically update our calendar in July and August of any given year because that anticipates then the fall season, which is when most of the deadlines are. Not all of them, but most of them. And you can see that on our website. Right now, um, ACLS has 12 distinct fellowship and grant programs. As I said, that number changes. And in any given year, we give out roughly $25 million in fellowship support to scholars all over the world. Usually, this is around 400 fellows um, each year. And each year, we get 4,000 applications from people all over the world across all of our different programs. Right? And I'll talk a little bit more about the Getty program, the numbers for that program in a little bit. But I think it's important for you to get a sense of the, the scope of ACLS's work and just how many applications we field each year. Um, in order to review the applications, we depend upon the service of about 600 different peer reviewers. Um, these are scholars, curators, um, museum experts, in some cases for some of our more public facing programs, people who work outside of the academy, but perhaps were trained in the academy. Um, all of these kinds of people volunteer their time and serve as peer reviewers for us, read applications, score them, and help deliberate and decide who the recipients of our fellowship awards are going to be in a given year. Um, we, we could not do this work without them. Um, it's, it's an immensely valuable service to ACLS, but then, as I will talk about in a little while, it's also a form of, of self-service and scholarly professional development, because when you serve as a peer reviewer for ACLS, um, that means that you get a window into the entire application and review process for our, for our fellowship and grant programs. You, you read a good number of applications. You learn what it's like to score. You talk, in some cases, with your fellow reviewers to figure out which applications are the best and what trends you're seeing. And so um, when you volunteer as a peer reviewer for ACLS, and I'll tell you how to do that in a little while, um, that means that you're, you're given a chance to learn more about the entire process, which ultimately can strengthen your own ability to get fellowships and grants down the road as a scholar. So we always highly encourage people um, to participate as peer reviewers. All right, the Getty ACLS postdoctoral fellowships in the history of art. This is why you are here today. Um, this program is now going into its fourth competition year, um, and it's generally, generously excuse me, supported by the Getty Foundation. Those of you who, of course, who are here and who are art and architectural historians know that the Getty is, is an absolutely integral player in this field, um, and this fellowship program would not be possible without both their, their generous financial support, but also their collaboration as real partners in, in the design and administration of, of this program. So, so that's, um, that's something that all of you should know, um, their, their keen investment in this and their involvement in this. It's been very important to us at ACLS. Um, the purpose of these fellowships is to support early career scholars in pursuing research or in writing for projects that will make substantial and original contributions to the understanding of art and its history. So there are a couple of different components of this purpose that I, that I want to tease out, and we'll talk a little bit about each of them in turn on, on subsequent slides. The first is that it's for early career scholars. These are people who are relatively new PhDs, um, and I'll give you the exact, um, the exact eligibility requirements for that in mere moments, but there are people who are recent PhDs who are just embarking upon their scholarly careers. This is an increasingly important interval in a scholar's career especially now given the coronavirus pandemic, given the economic downturns in so many parts of the world. Um, this, is, this is a very challenging job market. We understand that it's a challenging professional period. And so for us to have this program that supports these scholars who are just coming out of their doctorates, we think really speaks to our and Getty's willingness to invest in, in the future of art history, because we understand that you as early career scholars need to be supported um, right as you get out, or otherwise you will not have the wonderful careers um, that, we, that we imagine and hope you will have later on down the road. 
Um, the second part of the purpose will make a substantial and original contribution to the understanding of art and its history. Um, that means these are projects that are ambitious. These are projects that are going to change the field. These are projects that are going to totally remake our idea about what an art and architectural history is, who can contribute to it, um, what periods we're looking at. These are the kinds of ambitious projects that we're looking for in, the, in this program. We give 10 awards each year for the program. Um, application numbers have varied over the years, anywhere from 120 to closer to 200. Um, there are $60,000 as part of the stipend for this award, plus $5,000 of a research and travel allowance. We're quite flexible generally with the research and travel allowance. And as long as you're pursuing an activity or buying equipment or perhaps organizing a conference that will further your research, you may use the research and travel allowance for those kinds of purposes. Um, if, if you're fortunate enough to win an award, we, we talk about that in, in your award letter. The award tenure for this season, for people who are applying in this season, the 2020-21 fellowship season, is for the following academic year. So that means that it is the 2021-22 academic year. Um, and this also includes, a, this, this award also includes a one-week residency at the Getty Research Institute at the very end of the fellowship. Um, the Getty Research Institute residency is a key part of this, this award process. Um, the thing that we're looking at for the, the Getty Research Institute residency is we want the scholars who are part of this program to have an opportunity to meet each other in person, to talk, to connect, to network, and then also to really feel like they are part of the Getty family because this is typically held um, in residence at the Getty in Los Angeles. It's an opportunity for the people who are fellows to meet all of the Getty staff, to meet curators and museum administrators in the Los Angeles area, um, and to begin to develop the kinds of global networks that, that we hope will further your careers down the line in the future. Um, this past year, the residency, like so many, um, as I'm sure you're all aware, was held virtually, um, but, I, but I think in a nod to my Getty colleagues, it was, it was no less, less successful, um, and they really did a great job of, of fostering community um, in, a, in a very tough space and through a tough medium. Um, but that is a major piece of this, this program, um, and it is, it is a draw, obviously, for many applicants. Eligibility. So all fellowship and grant programs have some kind of eligibility requirements to them. And in order to be a viable applicant, you obviously have to meet them. Um, in this case, for this program, in order to be eligible, you have to have a PhD that was conferred between September 1st, 2015 and December 31st, 2019. So this is the window that we, along with the Getty Foundation, have decided is the early career gap that we are focusing upon. Lots of different fellowship and, and grant, grant, grant making organizations have varying definitions of what constitutes early career. For us, for this program, this is our definition of early career. You must have had your PhD conferred between the September 1st, 2015 and 2015, excuse me, and December 31st, 2019. Notice that we say conferred in there. Um, that means conferred, not defended. There's a difference, obviously, right? Um, and so if, you're, if you have defended, but you have not conferred within that window, um, you're not going to be eligible for this fellowship. One of the interesting things about this fellowship, and I think one of the most rewarding things about this fellowship program, is, is that it's available to PhDs who are in or are currently employed in, and there's a difference, right, in any humanistic field. Um, and so long as you demonstrate that your research draws substantially on the methods, materials, and findings of art history and contributes to the field. So what does that mean? This means that you can be someone who is an anthropologist, and if your project draws upon the methods of art history, if you feel like your project has something to contribute to the field, you are eligible to apply for this program. And indeed, the program has a, a record of awarding fellowships to people who are outside of the immediate field of art and architectural history. So I think that's really something important for you to know. Um, the interdisciplinarity of, of this program and really of, of the art history and visual culture endeavor to begin with is, is something that Getty very much believes in and ACLS shares that belief. Um, and so this program is open to people who are not necessarily art and architectural historians by training. Applications must be completed in English by the applicant. I'll talk a little bit more about that, about the different pieces of the application um, and, and language training and language skills towards the end of the, the presentation. The final aspect of eligibility that I wanna talk about, and I'll spend a little bit of time on this, is that Getty and ACLS welcome proposals from applicants without restriction as to citizenship, 
country of residency, location of work proposed, or employment. So I'll unpack each of those dimensions of this. Um, in aggregate, what this means is that this is an exceptionally broad and open program when it comes to this el these eligibility elements. Um, you can be a citizen of, of anywhere. You can be a resident anywhere. Um, the work you propose can be anywhere. Uh, your employment status can be anything. You do not have to have an academic appointment in order to be eligible for this program. I really want to stress that. Um, we highly encourage independent scholars, untenured scholars, unaffiliated scholars to apply for this, this fellowship program. Um, on this slide, I'm, I'm continuing to emphasize this point, um, and I'll talk a little bit about the first part of that. As I said, independent and untenured scholars are especially encouraged to apply. The other part of this is the, the question of citizenship and where you do your teaching, where you're from. Um, we want people who have had a wealth of global experience to apply to this program. Um, the international perspectives and the, and the uplifting of international perspectives is just vital to this program. Um, it's, it's that way for a couple of different reasons. I mean, I think, I think we believe and, and Getty has long believed that, that, um, that international diversity in, in both the kinds of people who are applying, but also where they're affiliated, if they're affiliated, really enlivens the discipline of, of art history um, in, in some fascinating ways. And it helps different audiences appreciate all of the, um, the, the historical connections, the artistic connections that happen across, across borders, across bridges, um, and, and all of these kinds of uh, intercultural exchanges that happen enrich the field of art history. Um, they, they just do. And that is one reason why we're so keen on having people who've had a range of experiences and working all over the world um, as part of this program. So this means that if you have studied, taught, conducted research in non-US contexts, we want to see you apply. Um, we're interested in your perspective. We, we want to hear what you bring to the field. We want to see the kind of work you're doing. Um, and that's one reason why we're having this, this webinar today, is to talk to those of you who have done all of these things. All right, the application and review process for this program. Before we get into the, the nitty gritty here, um, I'd like to mention something that's important. And I think it's, it can, um, a lot of people take it as self-evident, but it is really, really not. Grant writing is a skill. It is a skill. It is a skill that we all must learn. Um, it is not a skill that is synonymous or equal to academic writing. Academic writing and grant writing are really, really different types of writing. Um, they're different kinds of exercises, period. And so what that means is that you can be an outstanding academic writer. Um, many of you, I'm sure, are outstanding academic writers who are on this, this webinar today. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be able to translate your project and what you're doing, what you hope to do, into an application that is going to persuade people to give you money, that was going to persuade people to fund your research. Um, so you have to figure out how to translate your work, and it is in many aspects a work of, um, of a process of translation, taking your ambitions as a scholar and making them legible to people, especially people who are outside of your immediate subdiscipline, whatever that subdiscipline may be. Um, people who work outside of your immediate geography, people who are working outside of your, your time period emphasis. So I, wanted, I, I just wanted to, to sort of foreground the entire conversation with that, because I think, it's, I think it's very important. The good news is that grant writing can be learned, and that's one of the reasons why we're all here together today. Um, it, it's a craft like anything else. It's one reason why we encourage people, as I was saying earlier, to serve as reviewers, because the more applications you see, the better you get a sense of how people write successful grants. And it's also why we encourage people to apply multiple times for ACLS fellowship and grant programs. Um, our fellowship and grant programs have different requirements and different allowances for how many times you're allowed to apply. Um, this one does not have any restrictions. You can keep applying if you so desire. And one of the good things about the program is that if you do apply, even if you do not get a fellowship, you have access to feedback from the peer reviewers who've read your application. Some of you I'm sure have applied already and have received that kind of feedback from us if you've participated in, in previous cycles. And so what that all means is that then you have the, the privilege, I know it may not feel that way when you're reading the, the feedback all the time, but you have the privilege then of getting feedback from scholars from all over the world in different disciplines and different subfields who are looking at your application and telling you what they think worked, what they think needs improvement. 
um, and what they think might be might be challenging for you. So that's that's another reason why I often tell people to apply um, and and reapply even if you're not successful the first time. You get that feedback, you learn, you repeat the process of applying, and you do get better at grant writing. And those of us who are on ACLS, um, the senior program staff are all trained PhDs ourselves. And so a lot of us have been involved on the other side of this, this process and we've applied for grants, all of us. Um, so we can attest to the fact that it does get better over time and with practice. All right, the online application form and application basics. This is where I'm gonna walk you through all of the different application components and, and what you need in order to have a, a successful application for this program. Um, all of ACLS's applications are done online. It's through our online fellowship and grant application system, um, ofa.acls.org. So that means no mail applications, no doing paperwork, no printing, no faxing, no none of that. Uh, everything is done online. And as I said, you can find our portal to access um, applications on, on our ACLS website. Um, and it's always good to have have a have a peek at the web have a peek at the website and then look at in the application system and get a feel for the application itself. Ideally, long before you actually start it, um, because then if you walk yourself through the application, you see all of the different information pieces of information you'll need. You get familiar with the sorts of uh, answers you'll need to supply, and it's just better for everyone involved, um, including people who are ultimately reading it, when you've had a chance to acquaint yourself with the application, um, and then you go into it not rushed. That's, that's key. The first piece of the online application is a pretty simple online application form. It has a lot of the basic information that you would expect to see in an application. It has things like contact info, educational info, what do you consider your subfield to be, um, professional info, where have you worked in addition to being, you know, sort of your, in addition to your educational history and what you've done inside the academy, if you've done other things um, outside of the academy, held jobs in museums, curated exhibitions, things like that. Um, the other part of the online application form has your abstract, your research abstract. Um, this is your research proposal abstract. What exactly are you working on right now? Why are you applying for this fellowship? And it has to be concise. It's very short. It's a short text box, an box answer. And then you also have to supply a statement of the project significance for the field of art history. Um, those are two different things. And I want to be clear about that. I, I find that that second part, the statement of broader significance within art history is often challenging for, for applicants to do. And fair enough, because we all have less practice in doing that, that kind of writing um, when we're not just talking exclusively about our project's import for our immediate field. This is a chance for you to talk about what makes your project relevant to people outside of your, your immediate fields, but then also outside of your, you know, your kind of your, your discipline and think about why your project matters to people that you can convince people who are not in your field, who are reading your application, that this, that this project that you're working on has relevance, that it's going to change the field in some way, that it has the potential to change the field in some way. Um, and this is a short answer question, um, excuse me, not a short answer, just a short text box question. Um, and it gives you a little bit of space in which, in which to do that. Those two elements, the abstract and the statement of broad significance, are quite important. They are among the very first things that reviewers see when they open up your application packet. And so even though they are not the be all and end all, what I mean by that is that all elements of the application matter, all components of the application matter, they are still the first thing that the reviewers see. And so you want them to be good. You want to, to hone them carefully. You want to work on them. They're short, but they are worth your time when you're doing an application for the Getty ACLS program. The next major part of the application is the proposal. This is the big one. Uh, this is up to 10 pages. In previous years, it was, it was shorter. This year, we expanded it because we really wanted to give people more space to delve deeply into their, into their projects, into their work plans, and into their products. Um, and so now it is up to, it's a maximum of 10 pages, double spaced, um, with the following required subsections. Again, required subsections. You need these subsections in your proposal. Um, it's very important to follow all instructions to the letter when you're filling out a fellowship and grant application. Um, we're dealing with so many applications in terms of the volume that it doesn't mean as much as we would love to have the chance to go through everyone's application extremely carefully and say, maybe this person didn't mean to go two pages over, or maybe we don't have the time to do that. So what that means for you is that as applicants, you need to, to fulfill all of the requirements of the application process and you need to follow instructions as carefully, as carefully as possible. 
you don't want to wind up getting excluded from the review process because of an error um, in terms of you know, go over your page length, you forget a section, all of those things. Or in the case of the proposal, you leave out a subsection. That would be grounds for, for disqualification. Um, in all of these different subsections, the project description. Project description is really important. This is where you kind of lay the scholarly groundwork for the project that you're going to undertake during the, the fellowship year. Um, we expect a summary of the current stage of development of the project. We, so we want to know how much have you done? What have you been working on? Where, where are you in this, in this process? Um, grounding in the relevant literature. So this is the place where you do kind of your environmental scan, you do your landscape work, you show that you are engaged in your field, that you have a grasp of the relevant scholarly literature in your field, you have a command of it, and that you also have a clear sense of how your project is intervening in that conversation. Um, so that you realize that you're, so that you're showing to the people who are reading your application that you're not just kind of out there talking to yourself, that you are engaged in a scholarly conversation around the topic that your project discusses. Um, with whom are you in dialogue? In, with your project. Um, this is also the place where you're talking about your, the significance of your project for the field. Um, so there's a lot that happens in this project description. This is basically the part where you lay out, you know, kind of your, your objectives for, for, this, um, for this work. The project work plan. This is the place where you discuss the activities that you're going to embark upon during the course of the, the fellowship year. Remember that you're writing sort of with an, with an eye toward the future. You were talking about the work, you know, in the project description, you were talking about the work that you've done already and how you've prepared. In the work plan, you're talking about what you're going to do. That future orientation for this part of the, of the um, proposal is really important because you need to show the reviewers that you have a really keen and clear sense of what you're going to do, the steps that you're going to take, where you are going to undertake this research, right? What are the sites where you're undertaking your research? Why have you picked them? Why are they important? Um, all of these kinds of things are, are crucial parts of the project work plan. Um, we also want to get some sense of your, um, of, of what you're going to accomplish during each piece of, of the fellowship term. So this is the place where you're sketching out your, your future plans. The last part of the proposal is the expected product section. Um, this is where you're going through what exactly are you going to produce from this whole fellowship experience? Is it going to be a book? Is it a digital project? Is it an article? It can be any of those things. Um, it just has to be an ambitious project and you have to tell us exactly what it is. If, it's your, if, it's your, if it is a book, we would love to hear whether it's is it your first book. For some of you, it'll be your second book. Get, tell us, let us know, make that clear in the expected product section. That's really helpful for our peer reviewers, um, especially towards the end of the process. The next part of the application, the writing sample. Um, the writing sample can be complete, a complete work, so a work that is full unto itself, or it can be a representative excerpt from something else that you've already done, a piece of a book that you've done, a, a piece of an article that you've written. Um, we're flexible around that. This can be up to 15 pages, double spaced. Again, you can look at the ACLS website and see the exact requirements for the formatting for that. Um, and this, the samples must be in English, although you can have citations in, in other languages as long as you provide a translation. So I think that that's important to know um, that as much as the application itself must be in English, there are portions of the application that can be in other languages provided there are translations readily, readily excuse me, available for the reviewers. The bibliography, this is up to two pages. This is the place where you show, right? And it, it's sort of a complement to the, uh, the project description where I was talking about earlier where you're talking about um, exactly who you're engaging. This, the bibliography is a complement to that. It is showing the sources that you've engaged. It is showing that you have a, a command of the different, if you're, if you're doing a project that spans disciplines, spans approaches, that you have a command of all of them that you need to, that you need to have together in order to do your project well. Um, that's what reviewers are looking for in the bibliography section of, this, um, um, of these applications. Excuse me. The publications list. This is a chance to show your work. Um, what have you worked on? What have you published? What is forthcoming? Especially important for early career scholars. We know that you may have a lot of things kind of in the pipeline, so to speak. Um, list those things, note that they're forthcoming. Um, have you done any exhibition catalogs? Those kinds of things, list them in the publications list. Um, and as I said, it's up to two pages. Reference letters. I'm gonna to return to the topic of reference letters on, on a subsequent slide. For this program, you need two. Um, that's not that many, thankfully. 
Um, and the goal of your reference letters is to, to get references from people who know your work well, but people who can also speak to the fact that your work, ideally, is starting to have an influence upon your field. And, and even more so, if, you can, if, you, if this is possible, have a big influence upon the field of art history. We know that that may be a tall ask for, for, for early career scholars, um, but, but if you have people who can speak to that, so much the better for you. And as I said, I'll return to reference letters shortly. Finally, you're also able to submit up to three pages of images or non-textual materials. It's non-textual, right? Not writing, not paragraphs, not anything like that, but images or other kinds of supporting material that you think will help your fellowship application. Obviously, this being an art history program, it tends to be images, um, it, it tends to be photographs, tends to be reproductions of, of prints, et cetera. Um, and so the only thing that you need to know about that is be sure that you explain briefly why you're choosing those images. You need to cite them and you need to explain why you have chosen them as representative of your project. Again, all of the information about exactly how to do this is on the ACLS website. All right, tips. This is why you're all here. This is the, this is the, the big payoff part of the, the presentation today. First, as I was saying earlier, we go to the web website, go to the ACLS website, follow instructions as closely as possible, and log into the application portal early. The sooner you log into the application portal, the better off you're going to be. You're going to be really familiar then with everything that you need in order to submit the application, and you'll also be familiar with the timeline then. I'll get to that in a second. Create a checklist of application components for yourself. Um, this is not something that we provide necessarily like specific guidance on how to do, but it's a good idea. You're managing a lot of different pieces of an application. We know that there's a, there's a lot to, to handle and oftentimes you're applying for multiple fellowships. Um, this is where Excel can be your friend and you need to make sure that you've gone through every application component, that you know how far you've gotten on each one, that you know that you've put in your letters of, of reference requ requests, all of those things. Make sure that you have a really clear sense of where you are in, in the process and how far you're, you're, you're getting. Match your expertise and plans to the program's objectives. One of the most important parts of grant writing is learning how to interpret a call for applications. Um, that is distinct from writing the application itself, but it's no less important. You want to be applying for fellowship and grant opportunities that fit your work. Sometimes that fit is ideal and it's perfect. Sometimes it's a little bit more of a stretch um, and that's okay, but you have to be aware of the fact that any fellowship, fellowship granting organization has certain objectives. As I said earlier, the objective for this program is to identify early career scholars whose work is going to make a significant contribution to the field of art history. That's what we want. Um, it's important for you to, to know that. And if you don't fit parts of the program objectives, then you need to think about, is it, is it right for you at all? But also if you think it's right for you, how can you best shape your project narrative to fit the program's objectives? That is really what we are looking for. That's what all you know, funding organizations are looking for when they're evaluating people who submit applications. And so I think it's really important to keep that in mind that you need to always have in the back of your head this idea that, um, that you are applying and you're trying to fit the program's objectives. How does your work, how does your expertise, your experience, your plans for the, the coming fellowship year, how does that fit and further the program's objectives? How will you make this program even better? I said this earlier, but I will say it again. Spend time on that abstract. The abstract is basically the, the three or four sentence spot where you sell your application to the peer reviewers. They need to be hooked, they need to be in, they need to see that you are doing something important, something interesting. Um, ACLS does not offer entire sample applications for, pre, for successful, um, of successful fellows, but we do offer um, current and former fellow profiles that have their abstracts. It's on our ACLS website in our section on fellows. You can look at their abstracts, look at the kinds of projects that have been, that have been successful for the Getty ACLS Fellowship Program, get a sense of how people are writing, get a sense for what's included in the, in the abstracts, and look at those when you're crafting your own abstracts as examples. There's no one single formula, bear in mind. You're going to see different abstract styles if you go to the website and look at that, but that's part of the point. It's to show you different models that you can then adapt and think about as you're crafting your own. As I said earlier, every piece of the application counts. 
every single piece. You might think it's short. You might, you might think it's relatively insignificant. The peer review reviewers are looking at everything. They're looking at where you've worked. They're, they are looking at if you've done exhibitions because that will speak to your expertise and your ability to be an influencer in the, in the field. Um, they're looking at your educational history. They are looking at where you've studied, where you've worked. Have you gotten other fellowships? Where are they from? All of those aspects of the application count. So spend time on, on all of them. Argument, not description. This, this is a big one, um, and it's especially important we've found for early career scholars. You don't, you don't have to just describe what you are doing. You have to have an argument. You need to take a stand. You need to put your stakes down and describe how you are intervening in a particular dialogue in the field of, of art and architectural history um, and in the case of this program. You need an argument. You absolutely need an argument. Substantiate your claims. Support your claims. If you are making a claim in the course of your proposal, you need to balance it out. What's the evidence for that? Have you done work in, in, that provides evidence for that? Have other people done work that provides evidence of that? And you're going to cite it when you're explaining your theory. Those are the, that's the kind of support that we mean. That's the kind of substantiation we mean. Um, the other corollary to that, is, and I'll get to this in, in a moment, is that when you are writing this application, um, think about the fact that you are being that it's being read by people who are again in your field, but also people who are outside of your field. So you can't always assume that people will know exactly what you're talking about um, and exact and have a, a keen sense of the evidence already. You might not. If you are a Renaissance scholar, you might be talking to someone who's a contemporary architectural historian. Um, very different frames of reference. You need to be able to cross those, those frames and speak to, speak to people who are outside of your field. That's why the idea of substantiating your claims is, is so important. Be clear and avoid jargon. Um, my, my long standing joke about, about this is that if, if I had a dollar for every time I had a reviewer say, oh, this is, this is too jargony, this, there's so much jargon in this, in this application, I wouldn't have to work <laughs> anymore. This happens all the time in applications. Um, again, this, remember what I was saying earlier about grant writing being a skill and grant writing being very different from academic writing? Well, this is a place where that shows up most acutely. When people are reading your application, when the reviewers are reading your application, you have to be clear. They want to apprehend your argument right at the right off the bat, right from the start. Um, and you need to state exactly what you're doing with as little jargon as possible. That does not mean dumbing down your idea, however. Think, think, you cannot think about it that way. It is a, simply a different kind of communication for grant writing that you're doing. This one particularly relevant for, for, um, for an international audience here. If English is not your primary language, we advise you to ask a native English speaker to read and proof your application. As I said earlier, it's an application requirement, it's an eligibility requirement that you, uh, that you, uh, your application is all in English. Um, some of you may not, may be totally fine with that and some of you may be less comfortable with that. But if it's not your primary language, ask a native speaker to, to read it and have them proof it and see if certain turns of phrase make sense. Um, makes sense to them. It will make everyone's, um, everyone's reading a lot easier in the review phase. Choose your references wisely. Um, you have two reference letters. You have two people to ask. Um, when you're early career, I know that there's often a tendency to ask people who, who were involved in your dissertation writing, and that's fine. Um, but at this point, when you've, when you've gotten your PhD, we want to see that you've started to develop a network beyond your PhD institution. Um, and so the best way to do that is to get letters of reference from people who are beyond your PhD institution. Ideally, not required. We don't specify that. But that's, that is something that I think we look for. Um, and it does speak to your ability then to communicate more broadly. And it shows then that you are getting a name and a reputation in your field if you are able to do so. Um, so think about it. Think about it that way. Choose your references wisely and then prepare them to write strong letters. What do I mean by that? If you just ask someone and say, you know, you met me at this conference last year, we met at CAA last year and you liked my panel um, and we, we struck, we've struck up a correspondence with each other and I need a letter of reference from you to write for my Getty ACLS fellowship application. Um, and that person's like, oh, okay, sure. They probably vaguely remember you, um, but they're doing a lot. They're often writing a lot of different letters of reference they may not be intimately familiar with where your project is. 
things might have progressed since the last time you spoke to that person, you saw that person, you need to update them on where you are. So when you're giving, um, when you send out a, a, a request for to write a letter of reference, you need to prepare that person, give them your CV again, tell them the, exactly what the, what the proposal is for, tell them about this fellowship program, tell them uh, about any changes to the project. Maybe you've moved in a different direction. Maybe you've added a geography. Um, maybe your, your site has changed, your research site has changed. Let them know so that they then can communicate your expertise, your skills to finish this project in a way that aligns with how you are describing the project. You want those two things to be in alignment. You want them to be complementing one another. That's what I mean when I say prepare your reference letter writers to write well for you. Don't understate your accomplishments. Um, this is really important. In grant writing, um, I know that, that um, in, in academic, in academic writing tone, tone is very important, but it's a different kind of tone that's activated when you're doing academic writing. In grant writing, you need to sell yourself. You need to convince people that you are worth supporting, that your project is worth supporting, that you have potential as a scholar. And sometimes it's difficult, not for not all academics, but for some academics, it's difficult for them to sell themselves and for them to talk up their accomplishments. An application, a grant application is not the place to be understated and subtle and modest about what you've done. Um, you need to be ambitious, you need to not be over ambitious, but you need to show that you have confidence in your ability to do this work, to do it well, and that you have the expertise to do it well. So don't sell yourself short. Don't understate your accomplishments when you're writing a grant application. Be clear that you are the person to do this project. That may seem arrogant, it may seem overreaching, but no, you're just staking your claim to your own expertise and you're saying that you are the best possible person to do this research. That's what reviewers want to see. And so that, was, that is our last tip. Um, I'm gonna turn to Q&A in a second but I wanted to, to surface our upcoming deadline for this program. It is October 28th, 9 p.m. EDT. A number of people have already started applications and they're working away. Um, if you haven't, I encourage you to go to our website to take a look at the, at the application. And we encourage you to, to apply for this program. Like I said, um, it's, it's the act of applying for fellowship and fellowships and grants is an act of professional development. It is an investment in your own futures as scholars, regardless of, of the outcome. Um, and both Getty and ACLS try to be partners in that process for you and with you. Um, and we encourage feedback um, at, at every step of the way in this. And so we heartily encourage you to apply. We especially want those of you who represent global perspectives to apply. It's, it's absolutely crucial for this, for this program to have that, that kind of global dimension to it. So I hope all of that was helpful. I'm gonna stop screen sharing and go back um, and take, start to take some questions. Excuse me as I go through the questions. All right. So I see that I have a question here um, from someone who's asking, is there a preference for projects that are already underway rather than completely new projects? Could a project be seen as too advanced to be eligible? for the funding? This is a good question. Um, in other fellowship and grant programs, we have requirements about how far along you have to be and how advanced it has to be in terms of stage. This one, no, um, it's not. It's available to people who are just embarking on their projects and it's available to people who are sort of towards the end. Um, I think one of the things that peer reviewers look for when they are in selection committees and, and when they're judging projects is they try them to get, um, to get a, a range of projects sometimes Oftentimes in a, in a cohort, in any given cohort, you will see people who are further along, along with people who, who might have just be just beginning. Um, different committees have different priorities as far as that goes. So, you know, the, sh the short answer though, is that it's open to all stages. Your project can be quite new, it can be further along. What is really important is to make sure then that your ambitions and your plans then that you lay out match the stage. Um, if, it, if it is a project that is further along, it is going to need to be conceptually rock solid in a way that an earlier project may not need to be because some of the work is still being done. Um, so you just wanna think about that when you're answering this question about, about stage. Make sure that whatever the stage is, that the evidence that you've given aligns with that stage. And as I said earlier, that whoever is writing your letter of reference, make sure that they know what stage you're at. Hope that's helpful. 
Um, writing samples. Writing samples need to relate to the topic of the proposed project. Ideally, yes, um, but not necessarily. I mean, I think I think one of the one of the things that we um, that we often think about with this with this program is how the writing sample speaks to one's ability to, um, to one's ability to convey not only just the, the work that you're doing, but how you engage with materials, especially important for the, for the field of art history. So I would say that, you know, the, ideally, yes, it will reinforce all the other aspects of your application um, and will be in that, in that area. It is not required to be, um, however. So think about, think about that and how that might work for you. We know that scholars, especially in their early years, are often too working on a couple of different projects. You know, not all of your, your of the publications you've gotten, not all of the things may be in the exact same area. Um, what you want to show, though, in this in the writing sample, is that you understand how to do the work, and you and you under and that you've made some um, you've made some contributions already. That you have that you've made some influences already. I see a question about letters of reference. Excellent question about letters of reference. Um, the participant asks, is there any preference or sway given to letters from more senior scholars? Um, great question for a couple of different reasons. So uh, we get this all the time for across ACLS fellowship and grant programs, this, this inquiry about um, senior scholars and their, and their uh, highly recognizable name. Do you need a reference with a highly recognizable name? And the answer is that there isn't really no answer. Um, you want the reference letter writers who can speak incredibly well and in a detailed way to your ability to do this work. Sometimes if you have a very good relationship with it with a senior scholar, someone who's very well known in the field, and you've cultivated that relationship for some time, then that person might actually be the best possible person to speak to your expertise. But if you are just tapping a senior scholar because they have a recognizable name, but they haven't really engaged with your work deeply and they don't really know your work well, that person might not be the best person to ask. And that can sometimes show in a letter of reference. So it's really about understanding and, and strategizing. If you are asking a person who's a well-known name, do they know your work well? Are they going to be the most persuasive advocate for you and your project? Um, if you, they can't, if you have doubts about that, you might not want to ask that person regardless of, of how big their name is. So I hope that that's, that that's helpful. That's a, that's a great question. Um, I'm seeing a couple of other questions here. Sorry, it's in a few different places. Um, okay, do projects that relate or might contribute to Getty's methodology, sorry, <laughs> sorry. I'm looking here, it's telling me in different spots. All right, do projects that relate or might contribute to, to Getty's pre-existing collections and archive areas have an advantage over others? No, no, not necessarily, not at all. A um, couple of different reasons for that. So the first is that the people who are doing peer review as part of this process, the people who are actually reading your application are not from Getty and they're not from ACLS. Um, they are people from scholars from all over the world, for, from all different kinds of institutions. And so they may not necessarily be intimately familiar with, with Getty's holdings. Um, and that's not really a priority. It's not part of eligibility requirements for this program. Um, and so, no, um, not at all. I, I will say that the thing that you need to think about is that is your, is your project going to be something that's, that's interesting? Is it going to be something that's, that's current? If it's a project that is, that's, that's trending and that feels relevant, yeah, people might be might be paying more attention to that, but really, what the what we want to see out of this program is that you you have mastery of your field, regardless of the time period that's in, regardless of what archives it might it might gesture to. You need to have a command of of your field, what you're doing, how it relates to where you want to do your work. That's the important part of it. Not Getty's archives, not Getty's holdings, but where you want to do your research. Um, if you're saying that you want to go to a particular archive, you want to go to St. Petersburg and do your research, you need to, you want to look at um, uh, illuminated Ethiopic gospel, gospel books, which is one of our fellows um, a couple of years ago, his project. You need to then be able to describe where you want to go and why and how that location fits. I see a couple of questions in the in the chat about like individual eligibility issues, PhD fields, um, those kinds of things. What I would suggest for those of you who have questions about your PhD field is that you write to fellowships at ACLS.org. 
for that um, because that will be answered by one of our program officers, one of our program team. A lot of these decisions are, are on a case-by-case -case basis for those kinds of questions about eligibility. So when, unless it's um, an incredibly obvious answer, we often um, ask the people who have questions about their PhD date, conferral, about their field, to email us at fellowships at acls.org and we will get back to you as soon as possible. Other questions? Does Getty ACLS have a fellowship for pre-doctoral researchers? Um, so the Getty ACLS program does, does not target pre-doctoral researchers. Um, and I, I will kind of split this, the, this, the answer to this um, because Getty and ACLS are obviously are not the same entity. <laughs> Much as we work together closely, we are not the same entity. Um, and so I encourage you to go to Getty's website, the Getty Foundation's website and explore pre-doctoral opportunities. Um, on the ACLS side, we do have a couple of pre-doctoral programs, um, both a general one, our dissertation completion fellowships, which is for people who are at very, the very late stage in the final year of dissertation writing, um, and then our loose ACLS dissertation fellowships in American art. That is very different from the Getty program and that is, it is extremely focused. It's quite narrow. It's just American art and it's on a particular kind of American art historical scholarship. It's on research that is strictly object based. Um, so if you're doing work that is cultural history, um, socio-historical, you're not going to be eligible for that program. Um, it is very, very specific. But those are two pre-doctoral programs that we have right now, both of which could be relevant to, to any of you participating. Those are on our website. I encourage you to take a look at them if you're interested. Um, let's see here. I see a question from an applicant who's saying and that you've applied for an ACLS fellowship multiple times, which I think is, is wonderful. Um, but that you can't figure out what, what you have been doing right. Um, field is linguistics, and I'm wondering if my field is not covered in this particular fellowship. A um, couple of different things. So the first is that our reviewer process and panels change every year. Um, that is why we encourage people to, to try and try again. As I was saying earlier, we also encourage you to try and try again because you do get better at this over time. Um, for this particular question, asking about the field of linguistics, as I said, when we, got, when we started the presentation, linguistics is a field that's eligible for this program. All fields are eligible, fields in the humanities and social sciences are eligible for this program. Technically, technically eligible for this program. If you're in one of these other fields, excuse me, you may have to do a bit more work in order to convince the peer reviewers of your work's import for art history, for the field of art history. Remember, as I was saying earlier, that the project, that the, the fellowship program's aim is to identify scholars who are going to make significant contributions to art history as a field. So you can be doing fantastic linguistics research and it can be making a, a, an incredible impact in linguistics, the field of linguistics, but you need to be able to convince art historians that that's going to be interesting to them, that that's going to change their field. That might be one thing to think about if you want to reapply in this, in this coming season about how to tailor your application in a way that speaks more to art historians and speaks more, remember I said earlier about like the purpose, the objective of the program, you wanna be sure that your expertise and your project align with the objectives of the program. This is one of those cases. Um, so those of you who are in disciplines who are slightly outside of art and architectural history might have to do more work to connect your discipline to the program's objective. It's been done. It's been done well. We've had awardees from outside of art and architectural history, but it takes more work. It takes more, um, it takes more writing in some cases to do that. Um, I'll take a handful more questions since we got started a little bit late. Um, is it beneficial to be a member of one of the ACLS societies in order to apply? Um, no, you don't have to be a member of the, one of the ACLS societies in order to apply, though we definitely encourage you to be a member of one of our learned societies. What I will say is this, is that the different learned societies are often um, great vectors for just learning about these fellowship opportunities to begin with. So for this, for this fellowship program, for example, some of you may have come here through that. We advertise in CAA, College Art Association. We advertise through the different um, uh, sub-societies that are affiliated with CAA. So it's, it's generally a good idea because these, these learned societies often tell you exactly which opportunities are available. They give you the heads up. 
Um, the second reason why it's often beneficial, um, if not you know, a, a requirement to be a member of a learning society in order to apply, is that these learning societies give you a network of people who've applied successfully and won that you can talk to and you can talk, about their, talk to them about their process and talk to them about what they did and what they're doing during their fellowship year. Um, and they often have resources for people to learn how to write fellowships and grants better. Sometimes that's workshops, depends on the learned society, mind you. Some are bigger than others and some have more resources than others. Um, some have workshops, some have speaker series, some have like handy dandy tips on their um, learned society websites. So it's really about, you know, using the learned societies more as a resource than having them be, you know, having, having to be a member in order to apply. It's absolutely not a requirement, um, but we do encourage it for all of those reasons that I just described. I have a few more. Um, should we list all the research work activities residents in the work plan? Would it be fine to decide in the residency research trips when the application is successful? So this is a, this is a good question for a couple of different reasons. Um, first, we understand that it is that when you were applying, you were looking far into the future, right? You're imagining what you were going to be doing in a year and a half, year and a half um, from now. That's doubly hard right now. We all know that, we are all aware of that. We know that a lot of researchers dealing with it all spring and summer at ACLS, we know that a lot of researchers have had their agendas impacted, um, some, in, some in ways that, that are, um, are, are extremely dire um, due to COVID-19. We know that, and we know that it is even more difficult to try to plan ahead at a moment when people can barely plan for, for tomorrow. Um, and so we're mindful of that. We understand that at the same time, you need to do your best in order to figure out what you would do if circumstances are returning to normal. Um, if there are constraints that are COVID-19 related that you think you might encounter, you can gesture to them in your application. It shows that you're aware and engaged. But generally we do want to see, find evidence of having a research plan, having activities, knowing where you're going to be as much as possible. Um, so that's, that's something that, um, that you should think about when you're writing your application. I am going to take one more question. Let's see here. How much emphasis would you recommend for the theoretical framework and methodology in the project description? Um, Fair amount. <laughs> the thing is that I said we have, um, uh, you have a lot of space to work with on the proposal. You have 10 pages total to work with. You can apportion that in any way you like. You can allocate that any way you like between the description, the work plan, and the products. Does that make sense? So what that means then is that we're, we don't say you need to do three for the description, three for the work plan, and four for product or anything like that. You can allot them how, those 10 pages however you want. That said, I do think a fair amount of, of space and energy should be devoted to the theoretical framework and methodology section. Because this, especially for early career scholars, is where you are showing that you have mastered the dialogue that's happening in your field, the dialogues that are happening in your field. Um, this is where you show that you, you and, you, and where you, you just describe the fact that you have chosen a framework for yourself right, that you have the scholarly wherewithal, you've chosen a framework for yourself, you know where you're intervening and you've set it up, that you've set up your project um, to be argued in a certain way. It's really important for you to be able to do that. Um, and ditto for the methodology in the, in the project description. The reviewers want to see how you're going to be carrying out what you're doing and that you have done this, that your methodology is strategic. That's what they're looking for. They're looking to see that it's a choice. And it's not something that you've, you know, you've kind of like stumbled into or that you haven't thought deeply about. That's the space in the proposal. You need to do that. You need to show them that you have done that thought and selected your methodology with, with care. All right, um, I'm gonna wrap up. I see that there are a lot of questions I wasn't able to cover. If you do have an outstanding question, by all means, message us at fellowships at acls.org ask us the questions. We will get back to you in, in a short amount of time. Um, we're happy to answer questions. We do it all day for all of our programs. Um, and we will have a second webinar coming up. This, the date 
time, exact agenda are very much to, to be determined, but we will have a second one. Um, most of the information will be, will be the same that I've covered here, um, although there may be some different elements to it. I will not be the one doing, doing that webinar. It will be one of my other colleagues in US programs. But if you do want to sit in on that one, stay tuned, look on ACLS's social media, stay aware, we'll be publicizing it then. Um, and, and I imagine that will be in the coming month because as I said, the deadline is October 28th. Um, and I think we'll be having it in early October. I hope this was helpful. It was really great to have a chance to interact directly with so many of you. Um, that's, that seldom happens, especially so now. Um, I hope that I've answered a lot of your questions about the program. I hope that I've sparked your interest in the program. Um, and as I said, if you have any other questions, we more than welcome, um, we more than welcome them and get in touch with the program staff at ACLS. Good luck on your applications this year. Good luck on the job market if you're growing on this year. Um, and we wish you a pleasant fall. Thanks from all of us.